But, but I think real life change happens in the context of relationships. I don't know if you've ever read a book called Changes That Heal by Cloud and Townsend. I read it once and I hated it. I didn't even make it the whole way through because it, it really bugged me. And it was really hard for me to get my, my head around. I read it again and it really did change my life. And the whole basis of this thing is that, that God's, uh, oftentimes we think God's plan should be, he should come in, miraculously change us, you know, poof. And, and, and Jesus does something to us. And we think the plan B is if God doesn't do that right, he uses people to help us. And the whole premise of this book is that God's plan A is using other people to help us have real life change. And so it, it just helps so much. And it doesn't really matter, you know, where you attend service, if you're, you know, down south or up here or going to the city or Missouri, right? It doesn't really make, make a difference where you went to school, but it's the people that impact your life. And so I think we've got to be intentional about, about who we're hanging out with and who we're in there with. And so I think it, if you're in a small group, you probably right from the get-go thought, ooh, my small group that I connect with, that's who has helped me to change. That's who I connect with. That's what has really helped me. And we start to look at this, but for some of us, we look and go, I don't really like the idea of that small group thing. I want a little privacy. I want a little uh, distance from people because I'm not so sure I want all these people in my life and in my stuff. But what I want to do this morning is basically convince you that being in a small group is the best thing that you can do. And I want to give you a couple of different reasons sometimes why, why people don't get into a small group. We're going to briefly look at these, but, but I want to look at this verse that, that has really convicted me. Um, it would help if I clicked as we're going, but it says there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to, the, to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. In other words, he didn't have anybody that could relate to him. He didn't have anybody that was connected with him. And we're not just talking about biological relatives. I think we're talking about people that are really close. And, and I, you look at this and the result of this that he says there's no end to his toil. In other words, his life just didn't work. And I go, man, how, how disappointing is that? And I think we look in these things and, and, and we substitute what only relationships can do. It says he looks and goes, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. So in other words, this guy obviously tried. And maybe he maybe thought, I'll work harder. harder. I'll spend more hours at the office. I'll pick up some hobbies. I'll, I'll make more money. But it didn't scratch the itch, itch of having real life change and real life in the context of relationships. And I think your relationships, it's the most important decision you'll ever make. If you want life explained, it is relationships. Because walking alone never, ever works. Why would you do it? And I want to give you some of these reasons of why sometimes people push away from being connected with other people. And the, and the first thing is, I think it's sometimes it's naivete, where you just go, I'm naive about this. I don't, I don't understand. In other words, we're, we, we look and we go, we genuinely didn't know that we really needed it as bad as we do. And I want to clear that up by the end of today. Hopefully we can do that. Because ultimately we look at stuff and we go, I think I can handle this by myself. I heard of this story about Muhammad Ali back in the day when he was still boxing. And he gets on an airplane and the stewardess comes and says, hey, you need to buckle your seatbelt, Mr. Ali. And he goes, Superman don't need no belt buckle. And, he, and the stewardess just immediately looks at him and goes, Superman don't need no plane either. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I think sometimes we think like that. We think, I don't need this. I'm Superman. I can handle it myself. And I think we're going to realize today that it just isn't true. Because the second reason, and I think this is a real one, it's not an excuse, it's, it's a real per reason sometimes in who we are. It's our temperament. Sometimes we look and go, you know what? That's not my personality. That's just not who I am. God didn't create me that way. And I go, okay, that's a real thing that this is your personality, but I also don't think it's a good excuse. Because, you know, some people just, it's my temperament, no, nah, I don't want to. And, and we can use the excuse, and maybe it's a real reason, but we think it gives us permission to step out of being connected with people. And I just go, that's not a good enough reason to say, I don't like it because that's who I am. There's lots of things we do. I don't like to work, but, you know, sometimes we have to, right? You know, or all these different things. I don't like to grow older, but we're going to have birthdays. And we have all these things. And here's the third excuse. 
I'm just trying to expose some of these really quick, and it's from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And the, the third reason is this. I think it's fear. I think there's real fear. And I want to associate two fears that I think often uh, are connected with, getting connected with a small group. And the first is this, is what's going to happen if I go? Have you ever thought that? You're like, I don't know these people. They might be really weird. And, you know, we have this, this thing of, you know, for me, I'm kind of outgoing. You know, some of you guys, eh, you know, not so much. Or you, you know, I'm a little shyer, that temperament piece where you just go, I don't know, because what, what's going to happen? And oftentimes we, we think, okay, if I go to this group or I take this class or, I, you know, connected with, you know, take one of the prayer ministry classes with belonging or restarting or whatnot. If I go, what happens if I walk in the door? I'll bet you they've been preparing for months just for me to walk in the door. And they're going to say, ooh, it's you. We've been praying for you, right? And then they're going to say, come, we have a seat. And there's a seat, there's, there's a, a, a chair in a circle, and there's one seat right in the middle. And that's your seat, right? And they're going to start telling you all of your sins, or they're going to lay hands on you and pray until you confess them, right? But that's not how it goes. Don't fear that. That's not what it's going to be. We don't do that till the second meeting, right? That, the first one, you're totally fine. Okay, we don't do that at all. Right? Because it's, we're all having those same kind of fears. What are they going to think? Am I, am I, am I going to fit in? Is there gonna be, is there going to be anybody like me? But they're just fears. It's just fear. And I think sometimes it helps so much to expose our fears, to just look at it and face it and just say, Hey, here's what's going on with my life. And it can be kind of scary, but I think you, you just have to look and go, no, that it, it's not, it's, it's okay. It's not going to be this. And, and, um, we also have this fear of exposing our lives, right? If they know me, they won't like me. And I just go, no, I think what I've found out is the more people know me and I'm really honest with them, the more endeared I am to them. If I'm trying to fake it and, they, and, and I go, okay, I have no problems and you have all these problems, I don't feel close to people who are like that. But if somebody goes, here's the real me and Bleh, I just go, gosh, I can deal with that. Thank you. And I think that's the other thing. We just, we get fearful of being exposed and being who we really are. And, and it's kind of scary, but it's totally worth it to be able to just say, hey, here's what's going on with me. Here's how I'm messing up. Here's how I need help. Can you just give me some thoughts with this? So here's another uh, reason why we don't. If you're taking notes, jot this down. And I think it's our past experiences, right? Sometimes we've, we've just been there and we've been burned relationally, right? Raise your hand if you've been burned relationally. Okay, if you haven't been, I'd love to talk. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or you just go, I have been burned relationally. We all have. I think some of us, you're here today and you go, I'm wounded. I'm here for a wedding and somebody told me I need to come to church with them. And you go, but I've been wounded before and I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish that we were all perfect and Christ-like in the way that we need to be. But man, we've made mistakes. And I wish that the response... Would, would be healing. But I know oftentimes when we get wounded, we just go, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. I can remember years ago, this, this, this friend of mine who had been hop, hopped around in kind of different parts of the church and different churches. And as he, as he told me his, his story, I just saw this reoccurring theme. Somebody heard him and he was done with them. And then he, you know, kind of pulled away and the church was the problem. So he went someplace else and everybody's awesome. And then somebody heard him. And he pulled away. And I told him, I said, man, I'm, I'm glad you shared all this with me, but here's the deal. I will hurt you. And if you don't figure out how to forgive and talk to me and, and get this worked out for us together, you'll pull away and you'll go, you'll go somewhere else. And, and I promise that problem will follow you. And you know how I figured that out? Because somebody else had that talk with me. Because I had the same thing. I, you know, I'm cutting you off. Hurt me once. Hurt me twice, you know, hurt me once, it's your fault, right? You know, my, but hurt me twice, it's my fault to let you, and I'm never going to let you do that again. And I just go, that's so unchrist like Forgive as the Lord forgave us. And so I'm doing my very best not to hurt people, you know, do my very best to, to be Christ-like, but I will mess up, which is why I need Jesus. So we got to be careful to not let our past experiences keep us from God's very best for us. And here's the last one. And I go, this could be a whole sermon series, not just a point within a sermon, but I'm not going to do that to you and, uh, and you know, like length it all the way out. But I think it, it's the one that keeps us from the best in a lot of areas and what God really wants for us. And if you're ready, take notes with this. It's 
busyness, right? Busyness, because you look and go, I can't go out. I have something eight nights a week. I'm busy. I'd love to, but it's not in my schedule. And I just wonder how many things that I, we have said to ourselves, I can't do that because I'm just too busy. How many things that you're, would, that you're not doing right now that you know if you did, you'd be closer to God and closer to other people? Right? I mean, just think of the different things where you go, gosh, I really should come to that last midweek. And all of them are standalone. You can come to the last one. It's totally fine. The grief class, actually, that probably might not work, but I'm sure Judy would let you come. But I go, I'm just too busy. Figure it out in your schedule. Figure out how to do this. Because I go, we get so busy and the world comes in and the schedule gets filled. And we just go, gosh, I don't even have time. And it just happens so fast. And here's my thought. I just want to throw this out. I think deep down inside of you, There's not been a single thing that I've said that you don't go, yep, I know that. Right? This is nothing new. This isn't some, oh, wow, I had some, you know, super secret thing. Uh, A minister friend of mine posted on Facebook yesterday. He's like, I have the secret to life. And I'm like, ooh, what is it? I want to know. He's like, I won't tell until tomorrow. I go, this isn't secret stuff. And I think most of the things of Jesus are not secret stuff because he wants us to know. He wants us to figure it out. But I think... Very truly, each of us want to be in a place where everybody knows our name, right? Because, you know, in there, and it pro- if you're older, this rings a bell, right? You're like, I know this one, right? Where everybody knows your name because a lot of us grew up watching Cheers. And it, it's, a, it's an alcoholic Red Sox pitcher who doesn't drink but owns a bar. And everybody comes in and they're all connected where everybody knows their name. So I want to to listen to the lyrics to this, because it's it's actually pretty good. Want to take it away, Dean? Taking your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows. Come on, sing along if you know it, right? And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. It's true though, right? You go, if everybody knows your name, there's something. Oh, you might want to... It's really good, but we don't need to listen to it twice. It's on YouTube if you want to listen to it. But I just go, taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? I think probably some of you are thinking that right now. I want to get away. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) When are you going to be finished, Hans? A few more minutes. But I think sometimes we just want to be there and they're glad you came. And this is about a bar. I think Jesus' intent was this was about the church. And it's unfortunate that it's about about a bar and not not the church. And God designed the church to be this kind of place. And the problem is sometimes that the church is so big, you're like, it doesn't work. And I go, sometimes that's true. Everybody can't know your name. Right? Because you look and you go, okay, I can't tell if that's a a guest for the first time at church. I can't tell if it's somebody I knew from way back when because I forget. Or if they've been part of the same church I've been part of for like 10 years. And I should know their name. And so we pull back sometimes to just get to know them. And if you're a member of the church, we've got this app that has people's pictures and their phone numbers and everything. And so you can see them. It's great to be able to do that. But I think we should be family. And I think the the, the church is too big sometimes, which is why we have family groups, to get to know people and and be there. And I love in this in Romans chapter 12 in verse 5. It says, why don't don't we read this one together? It was fun singing together, actually. You guys made me sound way better. I like that. Um, All right, all in one voice. We're going to read this together. So, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. I need you, and you need me. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to somebody to your left or your right and say, you need me. Okay? So now here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your second choice, right? Right? 
Because we all have a second choice. Turn to your second choice and say, you need me. Okay, okay. I need your attention. (laughs) So here's what I want you to do. And maybe that's more intimacy than you've had in your marriage in like months, right? There of just saying you need each other. Because there is a piece sometimes that we forget that we need each other. But we absolutely need each other. And here's what I want to do very quickly. I want to give us four things that you need. And you're going to realize that the small group can meet these needs. And I want to give you this little teaching that I found years ago where they were talking about personality profiles and how we interact with people. And they talk about these four different areas. And it, I want to make this case for the small group, the family group, because I think it can, is the only thing in the church that touches all four of these areas. And so the first one, and most people never go beyond this aspect of relationship with other people, and it's called this, the arena. And you write down this definition in your notes. It's where I know and you know. It's where I know and you know. We're there together and you see all these things. And there's some things that I know about you. Just being together for a couple of minutes, you go, I know a little bit about from different people and doesn't take long because there's things we just wear on our, on our sleeve, right? You know lots of things about me. And there's things that you do, but there's lots of things you don't know about me. And I'm not going to tell you everything. Now, I need to have somebody who knows everything, but everybody can't know everything, right? We need somebody who really knows us. In in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. It says, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirits within him? Right? Where you just go, I don't know me sometimes. I need other people and I need stuff that that, that there's help in there. We have to have this other side. We have this inside. We have this outside that we, we, we show to people. But I go, why do people really need to know us on an inside level? Because all of us are going to have that day. That day where you go, I can't deal with this on my own. I can't deal with the phone call I just got from the doctor about my child. I can't deal with the phone call that that somebody just died that I love. I can't deal with this bad news or I got the test results or you have a heart attack. It's that day that you don't need the church of 50 people, but you do need a church of a couple people who just know you and they know your name and they're in there. And I go, man, family group does that in an incredible way, right? And I think of an incredible story about this with, with Jim Chip, who, uh, you know, Kevin Massey was in need of a kidney. He, they're in a small group together, and, and Kevin goes, hey, you know, I, I got a genetic uh, disease and needed a kidney. And so Jim goes, is trying to get tested and try and get connected, and there's delays and delays and delays. And so ultimately, Carrie, um, um, Kevin's wife, ends up giving Kevin his, his kidney. So that's an awesome connection in the family group. But it's his wife, so, you know, that doesn't count as much, right? Because ha- they have to. They're married. <laughs> but several months later, then Kevin's brother, who has the same genetic disease, needs a kidney. And Jim goes, hey, I was planning on giving one to a Massey anyways. I'll give, it, I'll give him mine. Gets tested. They're a match. He gives him his kidney. I go, that's a family group that's like meeting the needs of each other in incredible ways, right? Same situation down in the South where a sister gave another sister her kidney. I go, that's a giving group right there. And it's just incredible to see that. And I go, when you're dealing with those kind of issues, you don't need a program. You don't need a church service. You don't need, you know, a building. You need a relationship that says, hey, I'm with you, heart and soul. And the people that rallied around were incredible at that time. And lots of them were sitting in this room. So the first aspect, this arena, the second aspect is this, the mask. And let's define it this way if you're taking notes. I know, but you don't know, right? We all have this mask. We all got these things that are a little bit hidden. And I'm not safe if nobody knows about me, right? And and so not everybody can know everything, but there's somebody who has to know some of these things. And and I just go, you you have to be known. You have to be there. Because... If there's something that only you know, you're in trouble. You are not safe. You're not in a good place. You have to have somebody who knows your secrets, somebody who knows when you're tempted. And if no one knows, you are not safe. I can do everything on my own. Sarah! I don't think we figured in his day at all. Hey there, Aaron. Is it true? You didn't tell anyone where you were going. Oops. Oops. 
Oops. So that's a little preview of the movie 127 Hours. And it's about this guy who he goes out in the wilderness and he changes plans and nobody knows. (laughs) Dean's having way too much fun back there. But so in the movie 127 Hours, he's going out. There we go. He's going out into the wilderness in, in Utah, and in the, he, he falls through this rock crevice, and his hand gets, gets crushed but between a boulder and this canyon wall. And he's there for 127 hours. And, and, in the, and he videotapes some of this and goes, are you kidding me? You are out here, and no one knows. And it, you can watch the movie. I'm sure you know how it is. It's pretty gross. He gets out alive but not after having to cut off his own arm with a Swiss army knife that was dull because he tried to chip it away. So listen to me. You are not safe if no one knows. So what do we need? I need somebody who's going to protect me. I need somebody who's going to protect me. And I love this scripture here where Paul says, um, if we, we refuse to wear masks and play games... And he goes, he goes, I'm not going to wear this mask. I'm going to be known by people. I'm going to be open. My sin is going to be out there in the open where I can get help. Because the only way you're going to overcome habitual sin is by getting open. You can f- confess to God and he will forgive you. But, but there's some healing that comes. Some supernatural healing comes in James chapter 5. When we confess our sins to each other. That's where healing pay- takes place. That's where, where people protect you and they're going to help you. And I think we, we have to get this. So the third area is this, the blind spot. Okay? The blind spots. I don't know, but you know. This is the spinach in your teeth. Okay? This is, this is where you know, but I don't know. And I didn't know that I acted that way. I didn't know that I was such a jerk to my spouse or my kids. And I'm smiling, but there's crud in my teeth. Right? And I need somebody to go, dude, there's a little something you need to get out of there. And I go, we all need that. We need this help sometimes that, that we're, we're, somebody's going to come and show us because we all have these blind spots. We all have these things that, that just that mess us up and we don't see what's going on. And that's why I need somebody who's going to be honest with me. If you're taking notes, write that down. I need somebody who's going to be honest with me. Yes. I need somebody who knows that when, I, when I'm treating my life that way, that they're going to speak up. I need somebody who's going to say, hey, your attitude really stinks, dude. What's going on? What's your deal today? And I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to receive that from everybody. Right? There's times who people, where, where you know, somebody goes at the most inopportune time, you know, getting ready to, to perform a funeral. And somebody goes, hey, can I talk to you about something? No. You know, or I go, not good timing or there's not the relationship. Hey, I know I'm just visiting, but I think you're a jerk. And, you know, like I go, ooh, I want to be able to hear that, but it's hard for me to hear that, right? You guys relate? But I go, man, when there's somebody that I know who they love me and I've got the relationship, I go, D- you can tell me whatever you want. I had two, two of the single brothers come up after a minute and go, hey, bro, can we talk to you about something? We're just seeing something in your parenting that we're concerned about. And, and we, we wanted to hear it. And I'm like, yes, please. Like, what do you have to say? And it, they were kind of joking at the end. I was like, oh. But I was like in, excited to hear it because there was a relationship there and I trusted them. And I knew that they, they weren't bringing it up to be jerks. They were bringing it up because they loved me and cared. And they were worried about my kids not being able to watch um, Lord of the Rings. And so it was you know, an interesting thing. But um, we had a great talk about it. But so I just think there's a, a great scripture on this in Proverbs 27 and verse 6. It says, faithful are the wounds from a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. God says, hey, it's good, guys. It is good where, where somebody goes, hey, well, there's something we need to work on, and I'm going to help you. But an enemy, enemy just says, oh, you're wonderful. You're the best. There's nothing wrong with you. And then they go and tell their spouse what they really think. We need relationships that's going to help, help us. So here's the last one, and it's this, the potential. And here's how this one is defined. I don't know, and you don't know. Which is the way that, you know, like everybody and how God wants to work, right? And God knows our potential, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes other people don't. So what does this have to do with a family group if God is the only one who can fix it anyways? Or if God is the only one who knows? Well, I think that our our potential can only be realized 
when we have somebody there who's helping us to reach it. We have the right people around us in the right thing. Because God's system for pulling out our very best is for us to connect with other members of the body of Christ. That's why he calls us a body. He says, I want you to be connected. We're not supposed to be body parts strewn about. That's a crime scene, right? God wants us to be connected and alive and know what's going on. And, and he, goes, he goes, I want the hand to be connected to the wrist. I want the wrist to be connected to the forearm. I want the, ri- the forearm to be connected to the elbow. And I want the elbow to be connected to this massive biceps, right? <laughs> I'm hurt that you would laugh. But, you know, but, but God wants us to be connected. And each part does its work and helps us grow together so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And so what do we need in this one? I need people who are going to grow me. I need people who are going to grow me, who are going to help me to grow and and, and be in there. And I think that's what happens when we're connected to the body of Christ. I think, simply put, your life can be changed powerfully just by attending to church, right? But the only way you're going to overcome those those sins that dog you, the way that, that really in there is in a small group. Because here at the Denver Church, we recognize that large group makes a huge difference and it helps in lots of different ways. And we need to be making a difference in the community and in the world. The bigger church is amazing, right? The diversity that we have, multi-generational participation, both at church and in our membership. Our youth ministry is incredible. I was talking to somebody from this huge church and they're like, we have nothing for the middle schools and the teenagers. They're just like, you know, have fun. I go, man, our, our teens are doing stuff all the time. It's a little overwhelming at some points even. But I go, the racial diversity and the unity that's there. I go that it's just accepted and they're friends and we're here and we're supporting each other. And and I go, it's so amazing. So many body parts and building it up and we can pool our resources together to have excellent children's ministry where the kids are learning to love God and and people are helping. I go, the, the support for missions because we pool our resources together. I go, hey, you guys take this part of the world, and we'll take this part of the world, and let's help grow the third world churches. No, we couldn't do that on our own. And, but the big church needs all of those things, right? But the big church needs to be small too, or it just won't meet our needs. And so we need that. We need a place where I'm known, and they know my name, and they're glad I came. And all of our troubles are all the same, right? It rhymes. It's, they should make it into a song. But, but we need where you can protect me, and I can protect you. And we're there together. And let's look at this scripture, this final verse. And I think it's pretty challenging. Um, It says, a man of many companions may come to ruin. And so maybe you're one of those people who go, I got lots of friends. But the Bible says that's not good good enough. It says you need a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You need an intimate friend. And it doesn't have to be everybody. But it does need to be a few people. And I promise if you do that, I want to challenge you that, that it will change everything in your life. And, you know, uh, Zico mentioned the fact that you can text in and get connected with a family group. we got family groups all over the, the city. And even if you go, I'm some, from someplace else, man, I'll try and get you connected with, a, with another church in your hometown even. Because I just go, it's that important. It's that important. And you can text JOY to 80077. To be able to do that, to, to get connected, because I want you guys to all consider not just being a part of one. Maybe you go, there's not one near me. Well, great. Maybe you need to start hosting one and start leading one. We'll provide training and help because Jesus called us not just to be companions. He said, I'm not just a servant. I'm not your leader. He goes, but I want to be friends. And that's what God calls and why he came. Jesus said, I no, call, no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And I go, that's where it starts. And maybe you, for the first time, go, maybe that's where you need to start. I'm just figuring out this, your relationship with Jesus. But we'd love to sit down with you and talk and, and look at a few scriptures to say, here's what Jesus really is like. Because I know for me, it was very different in my worldly thinking and in the, in the church I grew up in than what God intended. But maybe you go, man, I need to heal my heart. I need to forgive so I can get connected with a small group. Well, take that step. Talk to somebody. Apologize. Because it's the best decision you could ever make. Because I think getting our relationships in order begins in a real relationship with Jesus. And that's where we can find the strength to forgive and be connected. So, that's what I want to encourage all of us to, to get connected to a small group. You go, I don't know what if I, we'll help you find one. It's where real life change happens. And I think it's what God really intended. So, why don't we stand up? We're going to sing one more song. Thanks.